The coalition government is vowing to crack down on kāinga or social housing tenants who are being disruptive or are behind in their rent, scrapping a policy that was designed to reduce evictions. Last year, just three tenancies were ended, despite 335 serious complaints per month, and more than 450 tenancies owed more than $10,000 in rent. For more, we're joined by Christopher Luxon. Good morning, Prime Minister. Good morning, Mel. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Uh, we'll start on this topic of the um, Kainga Ora social housing tenants. How many formal warnings do you think a tenant should be able to get before they can be evicted for disruptive or antisocial behaviour? Look, that'll ultimately be up to Kainga Ora. Certainly they'll get lots of warnings and lots of advance notice. They ultimately have a choice here, right? A choice to actually make sure they're meeting their obligations and they're not being abusive, threatening or, or being unruly tenants. Um, this is ultimately about calling people to responsibility. The vast majority of KO tenants are incredibly uh, proud and grateful that they have a KO house, but there are a number of those that actually engage in abusive behaviour. It's just not fair on their neighbours and it's just not fair on the 25,000 people that are on a state house wait list that are desperate to get a state house uh, and would mm. love that opportunity. So that we've, got to, we've got to call people to responsibilities. Yes, you've got a right to get a state house when you need help, but you've also got a responsibility to look after it and not to abuse your neighbours. And it's not just abuse, but in terms of rent arrears, how many months do you think a tenant should be behind on rent payments before they can be evicted? Yeah, well, what I'd say is that the vast majority of KO tenants, again, um, if they actually do have some debt, they actually are on repayment plans, and 75% of them are meeting their repayment plans and doing the best they can to pay down that debt on that plan. But what we're talking about, again, is people who actually refuse to pay rent and, importantly, also refuse to actually engage on getting onto any repayment plan. Uh, that, again, isn't just fair. It's not fair to the 25,000 people, as I said today, that actually uh, want to be in a state house uh, and are on that wait list. They deserve their shot and their opportunity and if someone's not going to appreciate the opportunity that they've been given by their fellow taxpayer who's subsidising that state house, then frankly uh, the, the, the KO needs to be much stronger in terms of evicting them from that, from that tenancy. In terms of private landlords, you have to, in terms of rent arrears, you have to give three notices within 90 days, so that's at least three months before you can evict somebody on rent arrears. You've just said that um, tenants who are causing disruption would get lots of warnings. I mean... If you're saying that there is going to be this long process before someone is evicted, does this new policy actually have any more teeth than what's been happening already? Oh, absolutely. There's been the, the previous administration basically made it, as you've seen, you know, three people evicted for unruly and abusive behaviour last year when we've been running at 335 incidences a month, uh, particularly in the last three to four months. So, you know, that's got to stop. There has to be consequences for that. Uh, Mel, what I'm often reminded of is, you know, last year I remember meeting a couple, a lovely couple. They came up to me, they showed me a photo of their new state house they'd just moved into with their family. They showed me all the photos of every room inside. They were looking after it like it was their own house. And then they proceeded to tell me that they had a neighbour that took the washing off the line, put it in the dirt and just chucked it back onto their balcony. And that as, as, this, as this gentleman's wife was taking the kids up the driveway to go to school each day, they're getting hurled abuse and, and threatening language mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff happening at them each and every day. They, they don't deserve to live in fear as good KO tenants in a great KO community being abused in that way. Uh, and as mm -hmm. I said to you, there has now been a quadrupling of people who actually want to get on a, need a state house. And you know, they're in some pretty tough situations and they don't get their shot at it because KO actually uh, perpetuates and keeps people who are actually abusive in those tenancies. So we've seen a message very clearly to KO to say our expectation is uh, you will evict um, unruly tenants. Yes, they'll get a warning. Yes, they'll get notice. But ultimately, um, you know, you have to evict them. OK, um, yeah, that's a horrific an example of somebody. Um, and I want to just give you a, um, a set of examples too. Two scenarios, and if you can tell me which family would be a priority. So you've got a couple with two children on a waiting list for social housing. And then you've got a couple with two children in a kainga or a house. They're um, behind on rent. They have been um, had continuous complaints against them in terms of antisocial behaviour. Which family would you say is now the priority to be in a kainga or a house? 
Well, personally, that's going to be a decision for Kayanga Ora to work out the policy of how they implement the unruly you know, tenant policy. What we're saying is we expect a change to happen there. Uh, but again, you know, I think that family that's on the wait list that's trying to do everything right needs their shot and a, and, a, and a help out and a hand up at this point in time in their lives with a state house. They deserve their shot. You cannot have a situation where um, you know, parents are choosing. You know, let's be clear, adults have a choice. Adults can choose to actually meet their obligations, meet their responsibilities or not. Uh, we mm. can support them with warnings and notice, but ultimately there has to be consequences for that. It's just otherwise not fair on those that are on that wait list and it's not fair for those neighbours that are actually uh, taking on that abuse. So totally. you know, we've what? got to call each other to rights and responsibilities responsibilities in this country and that's what our social policies have been about is making sure we support people when they desperately need it but by goodness we're also going to call people to account and responsibility when they fail to meet their obligations. Totally but it does mean that through no fault of their own say the children in that kind or a house um, they are going to be uh, at a disadvantage right you, you're naturally going to have to prioritise some children over others is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is we don't want to see you know, families uh, be evicted in KO you know, ever. You know, that, that's the bottom line. That's the starting point. What we're saying is those parents who happen to be adults actually can choose to change their behaviour uh, and to get compliant with their obligations and their responsibilities. Uh, and yes, there is, there is children waking up today in motel rooms or staying with family and friends or in community housing providers today, and those families would love a shot at their, their opportunity to be able to get a state house. So you know, there is plenty of opportunity for people to choose a different course. And I just say to you, if we've got you know, parents that actually are extremely abusive, threatening, aggravating uh, and unruly, uh, you know, we would expect that government agencies are already in those circumstances or getting into those circumstances, those families and supporting those children uh, as they should be. So you know, I, just, you know, I know this is, you know, uh, but there is already today, there are families, you know, there's three and a half thousand kids waking up in emergency housing from memory today. You know, that's the reality of those families. They would love to get a state house and yet another family or another set of adults adults and parents are choosing to be unruly tenants and that's just not mm. on. Do you think that this is going to make it more attractive for private landlords to lease to Kainga Ora and is that something that you would like to see more of? Well, we just want to see more supply of state houses, we need to see more supply of rental properties, we need to and see that would supply, be through, more supply through of... through lease, leasing potentially too from private landlords? Well, well, I'm sure it will help. What it will certainly help with is that when KO goes off and does a new development in a new community as they build more state houses, uh, you know, they lose some of the social licence to operate if they fail to actually crack down on unruly tenants. And so when they move into a new community with a new development, um, you often see communities saying, hey, listen, I don't want all that, all that grief and unruliness happening here. Um, you know, KO owes it to those communities that they're putting new developments into. I think this would help it uh, by actually making sure they, they're tough on the unruly tenants uh, and actually result in, you know, community getting more buy-in and more support for KO developments happening across in their, in their own communities. Um, your Deputy Prime Minister has uh, agreed with reports of, of a fiscal hole. Um, has Cabinet discussed the possibility of deferring tax cuts to later in the year as opposed to July, which had been promised? No, you know, that's our intention at the moment. Uh, obviously, all of our budget conversations will go through Cabinet decision-making processes and we'll deliver the budget at the end of, at the end of May. Uh, but we are going to deliver tax relief for lower, middle-income working New Zealanders. Uh, you know, that is a big You're commitment of ours. We think that's entirely appropriate in a cost-of-living crisis that lower, middle-income workers who are paying their taxes, working incredibly hard, actually deserve to keep more of their own money. That's important. The goal is it right, though, that the goalposts on your intentions have moved before because, as you've said, growth forecasts have changed and so that means your intentions change as well? Yeah, I'll just say to you, look, we know we've inherited a deteriorating set of economics and, and, a, and a pretty bad set of books, you know, financially. But, you know, good governments, responsible governments, you know, need to actually make sure you can end the wasteful spending, deliver tax relief and importantly protect frontline services. Let's be clear, you know, it's taken six years to get to this position because of the economic mismanagement that's come before us. It won't be all solved in one budget, but what we are determined to do is just make sure we are good, prudent, a responsible government and good economic managers. Uh, and that will take, you know, several years of just consistent uh, building a culture of financial discipline. That's what we're going to do. You've been definitive on saying there will be tax cuts this year. Can you be definitive and say there will be tax cuts in July? 
Well, that is our intention to deliver them in July. But again, but as I said, we're going yes through budget processes at the moment. Well, well, that's our intention. That's our intention. But we need to go through our budget decision-making processes. And as you know, this time between now until the budget in May, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, we put that all together. Uh, we're very pleased with the progress that we've made generating savings, uh, and we've made sure that the tax relief is fundable by making sure we've got revenue-generating mechanisms to, to capture revenue, but also importantly that we've generated savings and reprioritisations. So, you know, it's happening. Uh, we're going to deliver tax relief to lower middle-income New Zealanders. How did your conversation with the Deputy Prime Minister around the Nazi Germany comments go down? Yeah, look, I talked to, to the, the coalition partners uh, you know, regularly. Um, I raised that issue yesterday afternoon. We talked about that. Uh, those are obviously conversations that are private, but my broader point is here in Parliament, uh, all leaders of political parties need to watch their language because extreme rhetoric, as we've seen from Chris Hipkins calling us dictators or whether it's been Te Pāti Māori calling us white supremacists, none of that's helpful. It doesn't build the civility in New Zealand's politics. We need to focus on what New Zealand does want us to focus on, and that is rebuilding the economy, restoring law and order, delivering better health and education. So you know, my call is to all leaders is to watch the language uh, because just labelling people uh, is, is, is unhelpful into the civility of our politics. Is, are those the words that you use to Winston Peters? Oh, again, I'm not going into the, the private nature of the conversation, but you know, we talked about it yesterday afternoon. OK. Um, Winston Peters also in his um, Sunday speech spoke about uh, making English an official language. It's there in the coalition um, agreements as well. Do you think that English is a language in need of protection in New Zealand? Well, look, I just think it's a no-brainer. I think every one of your, your viewers this morning would actually be waking up going, I thought English was an official language of New Zealand alongside Te Reo and also alongside the New Zealand Sign Language. And so all we're doing is just formally designating it as such. It should be. It should have been designated some time ago. It hasn't been. Uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on it. You know, basically, we have three official languages in New Zealand, New Zealand Sign Language, Te Reo, and also English. Typically, official languages are for um, languages that are under threat in some way so that they are protected. But are you saying that there is an exception in this case to add English to that because you don't believe it's under threat, but you believe it should be there? Oh, it's just it's a formal official language of New Zealand. Um, and we should be proudly saying we've got three official languages in this country, sign language, te reo and English. It's just about a formal designation. It's, it's not a biggie. Um, and it's, it's a no-brainer in many ways just to make sure that we've got all our language captured and designated as official languages of New Zealand. Um, that's all that's about. Um, finally, Prime Minister, I know you're a big Crusaders fan, um, but the, uh, <laughs> they haven't had the best start to the season and they're playing oh, the Blues this weekend um, where your electorate is. So who will you be supporting now? <laughs> well, I always support the Crusaders, and um, even when I talk to the Blues players, they respect the fact that I have stuck with the team that I have supported as a little boy. It probably cost me two or 3,000 votes, I reckon, out of Botany each, each election, but um, the bottom line is you've got to stand up for your values at times, and, uh, or at all times, and, and I stand up for the Crusaders. OK, how do you think the, the team's going so far? You have confidence, <laughs> confidence in their season? Yeah, look, I think four games into it or whatever we are, and I think we're second bottom from the, on the ladder. But, you know, we've got plenty to play for, lots more to go. And, um, you know, the uh, Crusaders, they win ugly or they win nice, but they win. So um, <laughs> that's what's important. <laughs> Prime Minister Christopher Luxon, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's 10 minutes to 7 now.